I come back from man camp, and we've got a topic to talk about this morning that Dave left me with to talk about women's roles. I don't know if you want to call that the providence of God or the work of the devil, but we are going to have some fun with this discussion this morning. We'll see how it turns out. We will decide, yeah. We're going to be in 1 Timothy, at least to start, so if you want to open up there. Man, we're, we're going to have a blast, and you know, all weekend long, I'm like, we're up at camp, there should be plenty of downtime, we're going to have plenty of time for me to sit here and try to really plan this lesson and think about what I was going to say, and you know, we're all sitting around the campfire and gabbing, and we're, you know, running off shooting guns and, and blowing some, some clay birds out of the sky, so uh, we, we had... Blow anything up or check in? <laughs> Nothing that they found yet, I don't think. That we do. It is sometimes, though, nice just to get away, reset a little bit. So we're going to start off in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now David did the opening, and he got to talk about prayer and said, you can have the entire class to talk about the women. <laughs> but I did say I was here to take some of the darts for you. You, you did check for like the tomatoes and stuff and make sure no one had anything to throw before we started, right? We brought our own. <laughs> before I even start reading, let me say this. We, I think, as a church, have allowed the culture to pressure us into being very timid about saying some things that the scriptures actually say. If we walk away from here this morning and any of you want to call me a chauvinist, that's perfectly fine. If we walk away from here, and some of you are bothered or offended by some of the principles and ideas that we go over as we dig into scripture, let me ask you to sit down and take a real cold, hard look at what exactly is bothering you. Is it that you have a problem with me for being the fall guy that has to stand up here and say it, or are you struggling to accept the text itself from what God says? And, and sometimes I think that that's a little tough. And then afterwards, there's usually, with this topic, there's always uh, you know, additional questions that are going to arise afterwards. So please get with me, you know, obviously Jim, but you know, uh, I'll, have, I'll sit down with you and have conversations and, and, and go over things. So. Yep, whatever I said, complain to Dave and make him defend it. <laughs> I like that plan. All right, so let's start in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 9. So in 1 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 9, it says, Likewise, the women are to dress in suitable apparel with modesty and self-control. Their adornment must not be with braided hair and gold or pearls or expensive clothing but with good deeds, as is proper for women who profess reverence to God. Now I'm going to pause right there for a moment, because I even think that there's a lot to unpack in these couple of verses. Why do you suppose these verses are in the Bible to begin with? You know, and I've actually, at some point, heard some folks that were so old school that they would read a passage like this and be like, women can't braid their hair. It's like, yeah, it doesn't say that, okay? But there, there is sort of a principle here. Now, if you look back historically, the reason for some of these specific things that are called out here, as far as the, the gold and the, and the pearls, right, the expensive clothing, some of the, the, the real fanciness that they wanted to, to portray, was talking to a specific group of people. And again, let's keep in mind the historical context. We're in Ephesus. We've got some temples that are in the city. There were some ladies that worked at these temples And what they did in those temples is they attracted the men to come inside 
And they actually believed that it was a practice of this false religion that, well, they were temple prostitutes. And a lot of times, this specific adornment would be how they looked to lure the guys inside. Because let's be realistic, guys are a little visual oriented, right? But I think it gets into a bit of a bigger issue. And it's not that this is only speaking to that, but do, do you think maybe, okay, and, and uh, again, th this is conjecture, I'm making this part up. Do you think maybe that some of the women, especially the, the, the Gentile women who are part of this community, who have seen folks behave this way, who have held up that idea that women have to be dressed in order to attract a man, do you think that maybe some of them at this point, even some of the women who were in the church, were mirroring some of the stuff they saw that was being held up by society, even within the church, because they wanted to, to look attractive, to feel wanted. However, is that what a Christian woman should be doing? Clearly, we have these particular passages. Do we see in today's society that there are a certain group of people that might be referred to as celebrities, that are trying to set some sort of image of the way women are supposed to look, of how they're supposed to be attractive, of how they're supposed to be dressed, and do some of the women in today's church find themselves maybe trying to mirror that image? Maybe unintentionally, maybe we don't even realize it. It's a tough thing, you see. We've got a world where there are many women especially outside of the church, who run around and they dress in, in very provocative attire. And then they turn around and, they, and they'll, they'll tell the men that are walking around in the world that we are wrong for objectifying them. And that we're going to look at the women walking around who are dressed this way and they're going to say, well, you shouldn't be looking at me like that. You shouldn't just be looking at me like I'm some kind of piece of meat. I'm, I'm a whole person. Does anyone see a conflict here? You see, now men certainly bear full responsibility for their own lustful desires. I'm not discounting that at all. But at, at a certain degree, isn't it kind of tough, isn't it kind of hard to walk around in today's society and control your eyes, to control your vision, to suppress that, that lust back when you have all this visual stimulation being paraded around in front of you? Being put on TV. Have, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We have a poster at work and it says, uh, attitude is altitude. In other words, your attitude affects how you act, whether it's your speech or how you treat others or how you conduct yourself or how you do your job. I think, what, well, in addition to this, it, it, it's about attitude. And I think Paul is addressing that for the women to be submissive in worship. Uh, and particular, not to draw attention to themselves as in the world or their dress when they come to worship. Now, you started with verse 9. If I were to read this, I'd start with verse 8. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because he says, uh, Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So he's, he's directing his attention to the men. Now, they, they've broken this up a little bit for us in topics. But he's also addressing himself to the men. Mm -hmm. And then he moves on to the women. So I want the women to feel picked on. But uh, what Paul is saying here, what he's writing here, he's being led by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And it's for our admonition. But uh, women were to adorn themselves appropriately and be, have a submissive, not a subordinate, big difference, but a submissive attitude. Submissive indicates a line of authority. Subordinate indicates a line of value. Women were to be submissive, not subordinate. And the other aspect, just real quickly, in, in regards to what he's saying about verse 8, in, in the idea of men lifting up holy hands, right? It has nothing to do with posture of prayer. It has everything to do with the holiness, right? Holiness of mind in, a, in a, just our outward nature. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's tough, and, and there's a balance, and, and it does combine both of the sexes, right? So, so this isn't one way exclusively or another, but, but, but it does get really hard. And, and sometimes I think some of the ladies can do each other a disservice, not intentionally by any means, at any point in time, 
But how many times have you seen some of the women uh, talking together and they see somebody come in and they're dressed real nice and they say, oh, that looks really cute on you. <laughs> and some of the guys are in the room going, yes, it does. Boy, Jim, Jim, in these verses, even by inference, the men need to pay attention to this. Well, and, and I think it's, it, it gets really tough, too, because this is a really difficult topic for men to address, isn't it? Because the moment that a man tries to walk up to a woman and say, I'm not sure you should be wearing that, that's probably not going to go very well. There's all sorts of ways that's going to go wrong. And it's very understandable, yes? Um, I think us as Christian women, we don't, we, we don't go by the worldly standards. If, if, you, if you're living truly, give your will to God, living through God, the worldly standards, we have to be careful because we have to, you know, we don't go by those. Those aren't even our rules. Those are Satan's world. That's Satan's world. I don't want any part of it. So there was a time in my life where I come, you know, if I have, Lewis always said, if you have to ask yourself, is it appropriate? It's not appropriate for church. And that's how I'm trying to teach my child that. My, you know, my, my women parts are not out. I am not coming here for that. There was a time in my life I did li live by the worldly standards. And I'm grateful that I, you know, I don't live that way anymore. And I'm not always the best at it, but I know that, you know, I try my best, to, but I do not want to live by the worldly standards at all. And I think that's where maybe we're getting off at. When I leave my house every day, even if I'm not here, I'm going to leave as a Christian woman. I'm going to leave, you know, dressed appropriately. My butt's not going to be out. Nothing's going to be, I mean, I'm not showing everything. Even if, I mean, I try to be modest. And I think that's what the, a lot of the elderly women here and men have taught me that, so, you know, and I'm grateful for that, that I'm able to try to live by those standards today. Well, and it's hard, too, because even though we, we fight back against it, we try to put those things out of our mind, we, we try to behave differently, it's still tough because the culture still pushes certain messaging into us. And when you see it day in and day out, sometimes, sometimes our perspective even gets skewed, where we don't think something's a big deal, right? Or we don't think that we're crossing a line, but if we step back and actually go, well, if we compare this, am I, am I putting someone else in a position? Like, that could be very difficult, couldn't it? In fact, it's very difficult for, for the men to address. I actually heard a story once of a fella who walked up to a girl in the church building and said, listen, I don't think you should be wearing that because it might cause me to lust. Can you, can you please wear something different to, to cover up a little bit better? And he was well-intentioned, and I have no idea what happened after that. But it's, it's a hard conversation to have. So ladies, do us a favor. Help us out. Look around, be aware. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had a conversation <laughs> which got a little derailed, right? Where, where I, was, I was trying to emphasize a point about uh, a, a, a brother who had confronted me in something that he thought Right? I, I was, was in a position where I may have been in error. And I'm, and I'm fine with that. And, and the point there right, that I was trying to make was that I didn't get offended when he came to me and said, uh, are you sure like I'm hearing? I, I just want to make sure that you're not veering off into sin. He cared about me enough to say something. And we need to care about each other enough that if there's something, even if we're wrong, even if something looks like something that it, that it may or may not be, to still come up in humility and love and ask a question and say, I, I'm, just, I, I'm seeing this, I'm not quite sure. And on the, is your hand up? Sure. Okay. So, just, so, and on the other end of that, sometimes we may be the one that someone comes to. And it's really hard sometimes that we don't get defensive, we don't get mad at the person for coming to us, and we don't lash back out in anger, and we're gonna sit there and say, you know what, you even may have this wrong, or at least to have enough humility to be like, you know what, I, I never really thought about it that way. Let me go back, let me examine, let me think about this, let me really dig in and ask myself, have I crossed that line, is this a problem? Could, could I do a better job in, in this arena? Even if you don't think you're in the wrong to begin with. So there's a degree of humility there on both parts, so go ahead. And that's where the world has 
completely infiltrated the church is that we cannot admit error. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I think for any of us to admit that we're wrong, like it, this is tough stuff. This is a big subject. Right? Because you can't go up to people these days and say, hey, yeah. I think what you're wearing is inappropriate. Yeah. Because automatically you are the one at fault, not them. Well, I can say there are times where I worship with my eyes closed quite a bit of the time because the women are not dressed appropriately for worship. And there's a number of ways. That fashion tends to affect us all, men and women both but particularly women, uh, because, well, I won't say because, but it just, there are times when it's very difficult to worship when the women aren't dressed appropriately. I'll leave it at that. So I, I think we've certainly identified the problem, right? This is easy enough to see. Now, let's flip over a few pages to Titus, and let's look at a strategy, a solution, a, a plan that we have laid out in Scripture itself to try to deal with this. So if you flip over to, to the book of Titus, and you jumped over to, to chapter 2, I don't know why all these seem to be in chapter 2, but in chapter 2, uh, we'll just start at the beginning because I didn't have a chance to highlight where to start reading it. But as for you, communicate the behavior that goes with sound teaching. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Here we go, verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to exhibit behavior fitting for those who are holy, not slandering, not slaves to excessive drinking, but teaching what is good. In the same way, they will train the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, fulfilling their duties at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the message of God may not be discredited. And, of course, it goes on to tell the older men to tutor the younger men in the same way. So, ladies, what is the solution when someone maybe makes a, a questionable choice, maybe in their attire, when they're standing out there in front of somebody else? Who's going to fix it? Well, Who had? Years ago, we had two elders' wives that were mature women Cheers that would take the young women aside and talk with them. And I think that's an excellent solution. That, that, that is a very good solution. And clearly it is right, prescribed right there in scripture that it is the, the older women that are to take the younger women aside and help to teach and train them and guide them. And let me tell you something. You don't have to be an elder's wife. You can get offended if you want, but you don't even have to be that old to fit into this category of the older woman. Because everyone in this room is an adult. There's plenty of girls here who are still going through very formative years, who are still struggling with this stuff. In fact, um, you know, my, my daughter's in cheerleading, right? Amazing gymnastic ability to go do all the dipsy-doo flipperoos. It's impressive. <laughs> I could never do that stuff. I broke my neck. She can do it and it's great. However, it gives her a peer group, it gives her friends. She has some bonds. Sometimes they're a little afraid bonds because they're 13 year old girls. But you know, at the end of every season, they have this little banquet dinner that's supposed to be a nice formal affair. And let me tell you, I don't really want to go. Because I walked in there, I was actually, the, the first year I was talking to one of the other fathers and I just looked around the room and I said, isn't it a shame that a bunch of 13-year-old girls walked into this room looking like hookers? Because most of them did. Now, it wasn't everybody, and there were some of them that were dressed very nicely and very appropriately. You know, they, they, they had some dresses on. But some of those girls, let me tell you, they sure haven't been exposed to the church. They sure haven't been exposed to modesty. And they sure haven't been exposed to the way they should be behaving or dressing. And these are little children. Girls running around looking like someone who's going to walk down Michigan Avenue. It was not a good thing. And that guy for a moment stood there and was like, are you saying that my daughter looks like a hooker? And you know what? I didn't say it. He did. 
because he just had a moment where he looked at a situation through a new lens and a new eye and was like, oh my goodness. I can't believe I let my own daughter come here dressed like that. And I couldn't believe that all those other fathers in the room let their daughters come there dressed like that. And I'm sure that a bunch of the mothers picked out those dresses. And they said, oh, you look so cute in that, honey. This is not a scriptural, guided, uh, or, or explicitly stated idea. But let me tell you something. I think from 10 years old and on, every father should be in charge of his daughter's wardrobe. <laughs> I used to take Julie shopping. She enjoyed that because I spent a lot of money on her. <laughs> but, but I, and I'm serious. Go ahead. Um, this just happened this week. It was a really fun morning for me. Um, Chloe has this little sweater and she wants, and then she didn't like the shirt I picked out for under. I said, well, you want to wear the sweater? We're wearing this long shirt, you know, the white shirt. I said, we don't wear belly shirts to school. And I didn't use that word or sorry at, to her. I'm like, we don't dress like this to school. It's not who we are. She screamed and yelled. She didn't like me, blah, blah. And I said, and that's okay. You don't have to. But you're going to live by these rules because this is, the, and, I, and you know, I was, this is not the way Jesus wants us to live. This is not how we're going to be. So, yeah, I was a horrible mother, she said. But I know that was a win for me. <laughs> <laughs> so she could be mad at me all she wanted. I didn't care. That's what it is. We got to stop feeling. Yeah. It starts at home. You can't work if you're forced to kids to feel like they like you. Right. Who cares? I did not like my mom half the time growing up. <laughs> my best friend now. <laughs> I mean, who cares? And that's what it is. Everyone's worried about hurting people's feelings. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, as parents, both men and women, we need to stop being the child's friend and be their parents. Amen. Go ahead. It's, it, it, it is tough stuff, and it's a difficult topic sometimes because what one person perceives a certain way, maybe somebody else doesn't perceive that way. And, and I mean, and, and it's tough, and, it's, and it does become a judgment call. You know, and, and what, what's even worse is we live now in a world of social media where you have all these images being portrayed on there, and everyone wants to look great and put this stuff out. And it, it man, Tell me one positive thing about TikTok existing. I can't find one, okay? But there's plenty of bad things we can point out. And, and it's interesting to me that, that sometimes we fail to take that step back and consider the perspective, consider who might be looking at something, because a lot of these little girls run around and they're like, we're gonna do this stupid dance and we think it's all innocent and fun and whatever, and we're just putting it out there for our friends to see. That may be your intention, but let me tell you something, your friends aren't the only ones seeing that. And if one of these very young, impressioned girls who have not reached an age where they can think about this stuff with the way the world really works, and they think, they believe, out of their own na naivety, naivety, whatever, that, that the girls are naive, and they think that, that it's only their other friends that are going to look at this, only the other girls, that that's only the other person. Let me tell you something. If you took a moment back, like if, you, if all those people who would see something you post online were sitting there in person in a crowd around you, would you really be doing the same thing? If you could see the 50-year-old, the dirty old man that we like to, to talk about, 
But those guys are out there, covered in a world that teaches them and conditions them to lust and to look after every little thing that would see this young girl running around. And we wonder why we have a problem with pedophilia in this country. I see things on Facebook that shock me from members of the church taking pictures of their young female children over and over and over. And I think to myself, do they not realize how dangerous this is? Do they not realize how their daughter looks in that picture? It scares me to death. And these are members of the Lord's Church not thinking beyond the end of their nose mm -hmm. as to what can happen to their child right. because of the misappropriate thoughts of another individual. But the responsibility falls back to the parents to teach the children. And it just, it, it just it shocks me that we put everything we do, no matter how we're dressed, on Facebook. Yeah. It shocks me. This, this topic is definitely going to take more than one class. Yes? Um, you just have to be honest with your kids. We did. We explained to them, if you do this, they'll find them. Put this on the internet. The creepy 50-year-old men in their basement, that's who's looking at you. It's not someone your age. Don't make friends on the internet. We don't do that. You have to really be honest because that's the way these kids really believe the stuff they see on the internet. Like, it's insane. So you have to be honest. It's fake. It's hor Like, you have to be brutally honest. Yeah, and, and, and it is tough. And, and David, I'm going to use your story, okay, because uh, I don't know who it was. We, we were talking one day, and he was like, I saw a picture of somebody getting baptized, young teenage girl, in a church somewhere, somewhere. I don't know where it is. I don't want to know, okay? But he, he was making the and, and this girl got baptized wearing a bikini. And he's like, why does no one else see a problem with this? Right? And, and it, it, it's so wonderful, right, that, that they've, when this was posted on, fa on the Facebook, right, and, and that came out, and, and this was being broadcast all throughout the internet, do you think maybe somebody missed the point? Do you think maybe someone needs to take that girl aside and be like, hey, I understand you're a brand new baby Christian. Maybe you're coming out of the world. Maybe she grew up in the church. I have no idea. But maybe someone should tell her. And it shouldn't be me. Right? Go ahead. I think you got to take in consideration. This is where Paul's writing this to is Timothy. He's at Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the places where Paul spent a lot of time. He spent about four years there. He did miracles there that was not recorded anywhere else. You know, this is where, you know, they were bringing handkerchiefs to him and he, they were taking handkerchiefs off of him and healing sick and stuff just to, from things touching him. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else in scripture we have it. Paul's also dealt with, he brought the elders before he, he left to go to Jerusalem. He brought the elders to him and said, hey, you got to be careful. And he says, and it's going to be from people inside the eldership is going to cause problems. And now he's writing here. And then if you think about what he wrote in the book of Ephesians to him, Ephesus was a rich, rich city. And and the book of Ephesians opens up and talks about your richness is in Christ. Your richness is in Christ. And then he goes on and he talks about how you are God's workmanship. And so he's been driving this home for years to this congregation. And he's come back to Timothy and he's saying, it's God's workmanship. We are to do good works, not because we want people to see us. We want them to see God. We are to live a life. That people see God. And then we got to get that across, not to our kids. And he's dealing with adults. He's not dealing with children. We we talk about what we got to talk about. If you want to correct the children, correct the adult. Mm -hmm. And 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 we got also but at the same time we also have to have mercy and grace just like God does. That when a person becomes a Christian, they don't necessarily know everything that they are to do and the way they are to act. And we have to bring them along. Because the Great Commission doesn't say, hey, teach them everything that they have to correct and then baptize. It says teach them the gospel. Teach them that they need Christ. <coughs> Make them a disciple. Then teach them those things to keep. Because people can't, you know, Jesus, he healed people and he said, sin no more. Well, he was telling that to Jews. They understood the law. 
that we have to teach people this is Christ. He loves you. And we need to teach them to love Christ. And if they love Christ and they love God, just like if your daughter loves you as a dad, they want to please you. So some of the bad stuff goes away because they want to please you. They want to please God. Well, and, and you bring up a great point with the Great Commission is that, you know, you, you teach them the gospel, they get baptized, but then what does it say? Like, we, we like stop reading there sometimes. No, we are told to make disciples of men, teaching them everything. You know, Jesus says, teaching them everything I have commanded you. That is a lifelong learning process. It doesn't stop once you get wet. Go ahead, Dave. Just for additional questions that I'm sure are going to arise from this, if you go back onto YouTube, on our YouTube page, I preached a pretty in-depth two-part series on this uh, just back in October, so you guys could actually review this as well, and I cover it very, very deep. Um, and so that's something to just keep in mind. But at the end of the day, that's why it goes back to, like, Romans 12 and 2, right? You know, we are, you know, it's not being conformed to this world, right, but uh, transforming the renewing of our mind. Uh, and so... Until we really have a, a deeper, firmer understanding of really God's expectations for us, me and Tyler talked about it this, this past Wednesday after uh, a Bible study. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was about the previous week's uh, uh, Sunday, Sunday evening lesson. And it was about repentance. And so as we were having this conversation, you know, we talked about how in the Great Commission you are to make disciples, right? You get them to have a belief, an understanding of God, but it says repent and be baptized. You can only repent of what you know. I'm sure you're washed of your sins, but you're still a sinner. You just don't know that you're a sinner in certain parts of your life yet. And that's what Jesus says. Go and you know, teach them all that I've commanded you. And so that's post, right? Mm -hmm. And so the teaching continues. And that's the same way it should be with our, our young men, our young women, and, and, and for all individuals. Because we're at different maturity places. Yep, gotcha. So it's so easy with the, with that strong influence. Yeah. Well, the context here is the church. And we, we need to remember that in these verses in Timothy. The, the, the context here is specific to the church, but, but let's also remember, right, it, that it doesn't only apply to the church, right? Your dress, the way you present yourself, right, even out in the world, needs to mirror the way we would do so in the church. Butchie? Yeah. Um, growing up down south, you know, when we went to church, Mm -hmm. There was no if, and, or but. Even to school, girls did not wear slacks, period. You know, and um, you had to make sure you had your dress ready, you know, for church, this, that, and the other. And I had a very difficult time with that From with that when we moved from Tennessee to, to Pennsylvania. It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold, okay? You know, and it was totally, totally different. And I would get cramps in my legs from it being so cold. So Lewis had to finally just sit me down. He said, you know what, God wants you there. You know, so put on some pants and be comfortable and don't worry about it. And I think that's one thing that we, we were taught so much about this, you know, covering up, you know, everything. And I remember also going to a church building and like, and I had on slacks, a nice top, you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. And one of the ladies asked me, why do you have on slacks? Why do you have on pants? You know, and then I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, we're supposed to cover ourselves up. I'm covered up, so what's the problem? <laughs> you know, but, and, and I was trying to be a little bit ugly with it, but not real ugly. But anyway, you know, that's, we have to be careful how we approach people, you know. And yeah. sometimes, too, we have to understand that that pair of slacks and that top may be the only thing that they have, mm -hmm. but they are coming. They are coming to learn about what the Lord really wants us to do. You know, and I just, you know, no, nobody wants anyone coming in here with a halter top or 
Uh, we used to call them hot pants. I don't know what they call them now. You know, but um, nobody wants that. You know, but there's there's a simple way and a sweet way and a loving way to talk to people rather than to chastise them. You know, it made me really um, not want to go to church, not want to go to worship. You know, and and I told her was one day, you know, if it's gonna make her upset, I'll deal with my egg, leg aches. You know, because you don't want to want that to to, to fester. And, and, and you brought up a thought that uh, it's going to give me a real great chance to get myself in trouble here. You didn't mean it, sorry. We, no, 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 it's good. Uh, we also have a tendency to look at certain things as old-fashioned, as chauvinistic, and look at our current world and say, well, yeah, but we're so much beyond that. And if someone tries to even bring one of those ideas, we attack the person and connect them with a, a certain era or a certain image or a certain connotation that we have, instead of stopping to step back for a minute and ask ourselves a question, when it was this way, why was it that way? You clearly remember, and there's other people here who remember, there was a time in the churches, right? When the ladies did not wear slacks, when it was considered inappropriate for a woman to wear pants. Anybody ever ask themselves why that was? But one more thing to give. Yep, go ahead. Even so, wearing, wearing dresses to church, we were not allowed to wear slacks to school. Correct. It was a roundabout thing. There was nothing like this is just for Sunday. Yes, absolutely. You know, you're, you're modest. You do this. You know, if it's cold, put on some pants and go to the club room and put, take them off. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no way that, you know, you're going to show your legs in public. And, and I'm certainly not going to stand here and tell anyone that it's somehow wrong or inappropriate for women to wear a pair of pants. Okay, you're not going to have to chase me out of here for that. <laughs> However... Did, we, did anyone answer the question or realize you've never stopped to think about it before? Why did women once only wear dresses and not pants? Because the social norms of that time, pants were made for men. And so it's sort of <coughs> that these days you have pants that are made for women and pants that are made for men. And that is the difference. And, and there's some that that certainly applies, right? There, there's some truth to that as well. Jerry, did you have your hand up? No, <laughs> he's like, I'm not talking to this. Mm. <laughs> I think some of it had to do that the growth of the church really came from the South, and in the South there was women dressed in dresses, and they also wore head covers. It was a tradition to do that, and I think a lot of that came from that part of the country where the church grew from. Kentucky, Tennessee, Southern Ohio, and that was a tradition or an accepted uh, method of dressing for the women. And as the South came north, he brought it with them. Now there may be, there's always exceptions to every rule, but I think that may have had a lot to do with it. Well, and, and it's interesting because it even goes deeper than the South, right? And, and farther back in time before that, if you actually look at this, so I. I heard an explanation once, and here's the part where I'm going to get myself in trouble. Okay, I heard an explanation once of, uh, it actually came from a Jewish rabbi going back, far back into history, and he says, let me tell you why the women always wore clothes and never girded up slacks around them. He says, because men are visual creatures, the eyes of a man will naturally gravitate towards intersections. <laughs> and, when, and when a woman is wearing a dress, what you are now doing is obfuscating the separation of her legs and therefore creating a covering so that you're, you're lumping that all, so, so that, that your eyes are not naturally drawn towards that part of her, okay? 
Th this was an actual explanation. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard that before. I certainly hadn't heard it before. And I was like, huh, never thought about that before. It makes sense in the sense of this fact that uh, you're not allowing the man's imagination to go too far. Precisely. And, and I think sometimes that, that's where it gets difficult. And, and again, we can get ourselves in trouble real quickly. And I'm not telling the ladies don't wear pants. That's not what I'm saying. Okay? You don't have to tar and feather me. But before we dismiss an idea, maybe we look at it a little more critically and say, where did this come from? What is the principle? And how can we maintain this and keep the purity of the principle, even if we don't necessarily need to attach the specific practice to it? Dave, you had your hand up. And this is why, when you go back, and if, you, if anybody wants to go back and listen to an in-depth series on this, uh, I went all the way back to the beginning. Because in the very beginning, right, in the, after the, the sin, and, you know, uh, well, in, well, in the garden, right, uh, after they sinned, they realized they were naked, they uh, sewed fig leaves together, which the fig leaves that they sewed together covered what our modern day, you know, bikinis and swimsuits probably would have covered, and they still hid themselves when God came into the garden. When God came into the garden, he said, where are you at? But because I was naked, I hid myself and told you you're naked. And so we know that in like verse 21, we see what? We see God then kills animals and makes uh, coverings of skins that go from the shoulder to the knee. And so when you want to know what God's divine standard is, there should be coverings of skin from the shoulder to the knee. Anything beyond that is human tradition, right? And we have further conversations about that in the coming weeks. But uh, you know, we cover this pretty in deep in those in those two two probably forty minute sermons, and so that's God's divine standard, right? So even when Adam did make the the loin coverings, he still knew that he was naked. And, so, and, and by the way, and before I get myself in too deep, like we're out of time, so we're going to stop this one. But uh, there's actually something that I heard Matt Perry say once, who has been doing a wonderful job, right, trying to raise those girls, and. He said, you know, when I've been trying to teach the girls about modesty, I teach them to cover the three Bs. Boobs, butts, and bellies. And generally, with society's way that they would look at these things, not all three of those show up on that list to be covered. But in God's model of modesty, guess what? All of them do. And, and I've co-opted that, and, I, and I've said it to, to my girls. And I'm like, that is a great, like, it's an easy mnemonic for them to remember. It's, a, it's, it's an easy thing and to, to stop and ask yourselves because when you're looking at all those images that you see in the world, there's an awful lot of that that's not covered up. And it's very easy, especially when they're young and impressionable, to not really get that whole message in. And I've had times myself, right, that I've, had, that I've seen one of the girls come out and they're like, oh, I'm dressed for I'm like, no, you're not. Go back, change your clothes. Put something else on that covers you appropriately. Jim, do you know if the schools still have dress codes? Because when I, I mean, it was a long time ago, mm -hmm. there, was, there was a dress code that, that girls had to adhere to as far as. Through middle school, now the high schools are practically naked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they are. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even if they have it on school. paper. Yeah. Nobody, nobody's enforcing it, and, and the folks are not standing there and, and saying something about it. And it is. It, it gets super difficult. We are totally out of time. So we're going to close in a quick prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, Lord, we know that this is a, a difficult subject, and, and we know that the world has all sorts of different ideas that they are pressing upon us, Lord, but we just ask that you will help us to dig into your scriptures. Help us to look at your model. Help us to live the right way, to do the right things, and to make the right choices. In fact, Lord, we know we, even there, there, there's sometimes that, that your word works in our lives and teaches us that sometimes there is a wise choice, even if... Uh, a different choice may not necessarily explicitly be called out as sin. Lord, we ask that you will help us to make the wise choices. Help us to get so far away from that line that there can't even be a question in our lives whether or not we're sinning. Lord, we know this is a difficult topic for, for both the men and the women. We know that, that the, the, the men need a greater deal of discipline, and, and it's something that, that very many men in our world, in our society, and yes, even in, in your church, that they still struggle with today. And Lord, we ask that you give them strength. We also ask that you uh, be with the women and help to give them the humility, help to, to give them the proper judgment so that, that 
the, the two cannot be a stumbling block either way to each other. Lord, we know it, it, it's such a tough thing. It's such a tough subject. And, and Lord, we, we just pray and we ask that, that, that through anything that I've said, that we've not offended anyone today because that is not our intent. Our intent is to teach your word, your principles, and your model. Because, Lord, we all know that when we follow your model, it simply works out better everywhere in our lives. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.